Today in Draw My Life, the Berlin Wall. It sometimes happens, just like with Halley's Comet, that the world comes together to fight a common enemy. However, this is not always the case, and there is no need to force our eyes when looking back. Do you remember the year 1945? Not even a century ago. What about 1989? Even more recent. Well, during these years, 1945 and 1989, the world was divided and in turmoil, in what is known as the Cold War. After the end of World War II, what year? 1945. And with approximately 55 million victims behind them, there were still some countries that wanted to party more and see who would claim to be the most powerful in the world. And these were... the United States and the Soviet Union. They got involved in the Cold War, a conflict located in various territories across the globe differentiated between communists and capitalists. At the same time, the leading countries participated in a very exciting arms race to gain nuclear control. Now let's focus on the conflict that developed in Germany and which materialized in a stone wall almost 4 meters high and 155 kilometers long. What caused this ideological barrier to be built? How, after a devastating war, did it reach this point again? After World War II, Germany was occupied and divided by the Allies into four zones of operation. France kept the Southwest, United Kingdom had the Northwest, United States the South, and the Soviet Union the West. Easy. The initial intention was to unite the country again, but it resulted in something quite different. Gradually, the capitalist allies were able to unite their power and the Soviet side became more and more distant. In other words, in 1949, the Western Front came together as the Federal Republic of Germany with Bonn as the capital, and shortly afterwards, the USSR formed the German Democratic Republic whose capital was East Berlin. Conflict was served. The borders in both Germanys were strengthened, creating an even greater abyss. To begin with, West Germany had freedom of both speech and movement. Besides, with the Marshall Plan in the United States, the economy on the western side of the country was being revived. On the other hand, the social and political norms in East Germany were far stricter, and its planned economy wasn't helping the situation on the eastern side of the country. It was therefore not surprising that after this division, many people emigrated from the GDR to the FRG, searching for a better life. For this reason, in 1952, the borders were protected with fences and more guards. Only those with a special permit could pass from one side of the border to the other. Despite the efforts, communication between the West and East Berlin was very difficult to control. It is estimated that, at this point between 1949 and 1961, approximately 3 million people abandoned the GDR. And, since most of them were young workers, they caused a the breakdown in Soviet economy. It should be noted that around 50,000 people worked in East Berlin, but lived in West Berlin, thus taking advantage of the economic benefits of the East. They were known as frontiersmen. From August 4th, 1961, they had to be registered as such in order to be controlled and to not cause any kind of trouble. To summarize, due to, among other things, one-way migration from one side to the other, the political and economic system of the GDR was on the verge of collapse, and though in June of 1961 they concealed their intention to build the wall, two months later they were pretty obvious about it. On August 11th, the People's Chamber, Parliament of the GDR, agreed to take measures to slow down the exodus. They didn't have enough time to get down to business. Thus, on the night of August 12, 1961, East Germany stopped the escape of its citizens, the hard way, by building a temporary wall, a 155-kilometer fence, which divided Berlin and its surroundings in two. Thousands of soldiers from the Soviet army began to guard the wall. 69 control points were closed down in the border, but only 12 were left open. Traffic of all means of transport was stopped from one side to the other. In the following days, the wired fences were replaced by concrete panels. To do this, they had to raise the paving stones of the streets. They evicted the houses on the borderline or boarded up doors and windows facing West Berlin. They were only accessible from the back. The city, their city, had been split in half. Imagine the anxiety and terror they felt in the face of this new and distressing reality. Just to give you an idea, on September, the wall had been built at the beginning of August. 85 men from the surveillance forces abandoned their positions, and 400 civilians managed to flee. 
This is a moment from the photograph of the policeman jumping over fences to escape in Bernauerstrasse Street. The mayor of West Berlin expressed his concern and rejection of the creation of this inhumane division, this wall of shame. On the other hand, do you know what they called the concrete mass in the GDR? Anti-fascist protective wall, as they claimed it was a shield against Western attacks, even though deep down they kept the human capital flight thing going. After the construction, the Allied movement, led by Kennedy, was slow, and there came a point where it was rumored that the wall hadn't really taken them by surprise. But just as Kennedy said, it was a not very nice solution, but a wall is a hell of a lot better than a war. Still, he did not hesitate to send 1,500 soldiers to reinforce West Berlin. Slowly, the defensive elements of the wall were perfected, like the round surface that prevented them from gripping the wall, to create what was called the death strip. On the East Germany side, a large moat was built, and fences were put up on the wall as well as obstacles to prevent the access to vehicles. As if this wasn't enough, and someone tried to climb up the wall, mines were placed too. Oh, and all of this was reinforced with strong lights. In turn, the entire route was guarded by military personnel who patrolled with dogs 24 hours a day, and every few meters there were control towers guarded by military men, armed, obviously. These were the famous checkpoints, where anyone who wanted to pass through had to show their ID. This demand did not please the American authorities, and one day at the end of October, there was an incident between East and West Berlin forces at Checkpoint Charlie, when a leader of the FRG wanted to pass through without identifying himself. Tension was evident as both sides set out to defend their side. Fortunately, the conflict dissolved within the hours and remained an unforgettable event. Nevertheless, more than 5,000 was the number of people who tried to escape through the Berlin Wall. Although there are no exact numbers for the deaths, they were around 140. One of the most well-known victims is Peter Fechter, who was fatally shot on the eastern side of the wall, but within sight of West Berlin. Just like Peter, some were shot down others perished directly in the icy arms of the wall or by committing suicide after being discovered. In fact, there are cases of people who died when subjected to the strict controls of border soldiers. But there were also those who succeeded, such as the 57 who escaped through a 145 meter long and a 12 meter deep underground tunnel dug by Westerners in early October 1964. The passage went through the wall from an abandoned bakery to a private inner courtyard. Unfortunately, they were discovered before all of them, around 120 people were fleeing, got to the other side. The situation was unsustainable. So was the wall, which was beginning to crack. Throughout its 28 years, other events developed, such as the Vietnam War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Red Phone, Kennedy's death, and the landing of the United States on the moon, causing, by the end of the 1980s, an emerging economic crisis. The differences between the capitalist and communist worlds were even more evident. So in 1989 in Moscow, it was Mikhail Gorbachev's turn, who was general secretary of the Communist Party, implemented numerous reforms in the policies of the USSR, betting on the transparency of the country and its satellite states. Nevertheless, Eric Honecker, president of the GDR, found it difficult to accept such reforms. Furthermore, in May of that year, the borders between Austria and Hungary were opened, and many East Germans began to travel to Hungary to ease their way into West Germany through Austria. Therefore, on October 9, 1989, the streets of Leipzig were filled with cries demanding freedom. Soon, protests swept across East Germany. Due to such pressure, Honecker resigned and was replaced by Egon Krenz. However, tensions remained. A month later, on the 9th of October, the spokesman for the GDR government, finding himself between a rock and a hard place at a press conference, announced that the citizens of both Germanys could move around as tourists. When asked by a journalist about the date on which this would be allowed, the official replied, This comes into effect, up to my opinion, at once, instantly. And so it did. These words brought thousands of people to the wall of shame to demand that the gates be opened. Soldiers at the border were not informed. But within hours, the first citizens of East Berlin were enthusiastically received in West Berlin. Gradually, mass euphoria crossed the wall that had oppressed the population so much. In the early hours of November 10, Berliners, armed with picks, hammers, and restrained emotion, stone by stone made their way to freedom. People who reunited again after 28 years embraced each other as if it were a dream, something they never expected to happen. Everyone from their homes watched this historical event expectantly, as if it were a film accompanied by the sound of Rostropovich's cello, Exile in the West. While the wall was being destroyed, a group of artists proposed to keep a part of it to create an art gallery for urban art. It is currently located in an area known as the East Side Gallery, 
We have one kilometer of wall decorated with paintings showing events related to that period of time. This way, once again, art forces us to remember. After this collapse came the work to restore Germany. Helmut Kohl asked Gorbachev to withdraw from East Germany and take his 350,000 soldiers with him. These expenses were paid for by the Western side. Finally, on October 3, 1990, the unification of Germany became a reality. The fall of the Berlin Wall is considered a symbol for the end of the Cold War. It was an anticipated metaphor for what would happen later in the USSR. Eventually, the communist pillar in Europe was demolished, and in 1991, the Soviet Union was officially dismantled. This video, in addition to passing the history exam, should help us learn from our mistakes. We should not build walls, but rather take them down. Tell us in the comments below which other walls you would like us to talk about. Don't forget to subscribe. Until the next video!